Okay, I found this interesting link. It's from a guy named Mr. Dark. And uh, he has produced a blog in which he claims that, uh, you know, he claims that he has solved the mystery of the Patterson Gilman film. He says it's a hoax. Well, let's examine what this guy is saying. Patterson Gimlin and the fake Bigfoot suit. This article includes my theory that Ray Wallace and Roger Patterson both conspired to hoax the infamous Patterson Gimlin film. This post, when initially created, drew out some of the nuttiest of the nutty Bigfoot followers and caused an uproar in the Bigfoot community. The thing about this film in particular is that it has a tendency to bring out the most advanced of the fringe lunatics in the Bigfoot community. They can be almost dangerously nutty in their rigorous defense of this film as the holy grail of Bigfoot science. After all, it is the only film that has been regarded as genuine. It is the only time this particular creature was ever filmed and the only time that this particular creature was seen before or since, which obviously exposes it for a fake. Uh, no it doesn't. I don't know where you're, I don't know where you're coming from, dude, but it does not expose it for a fake. What I mean by that is never before or since has there been a Bigfoot of this quality, even though the quality isn't all that great as we'll soon see. Before we go into my analysis of the patterson Gilman film, and before I reveal where the costume came from for the hoax, let's first look at the history of Bigfoot, because this is very important, as you will soon see. I also want to go over some of the many theories involving the patterson Gilman film, so that you, as a lay person or expert alike in this 50-year-old mystery, We'll say things clearly and in the proper light about just what the debate is over. This guy in a monkey suit? Well, you know, first of all, where's the suit? That would be my question. Where is the suit, Mr. Dark? You tell me, where's the suit? The suit has not been produced in 50 years. And it ain't gonna be, because it wasn't a suit. 1958 marked the beginning for modern Bigfoot sightings. A lumber contractor named Ray Wallace decided to play a prank on some of his workers. Jerry Crew, who was seen holding one of the footprint casts from the wooden feet belonging to Wallace. I should also note that there was a second set of fake feet which his brothers used to help him make tracks. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Ray Wallace ever hoaxed anybody. He may have had some fake footprints, but as Bill Miller has shown, this does not even come close to matching the uh, <clears throat> the little fake uh, wooden feet that have been shown by the Wallace family. And if there is a second set of fake feet, where are they? They have not been produced, now have they? Now there are some Bigfoot believers that will cite Native American mythology as the source of Bigfoot lore. However, upon closer inspection and with the understanding of the cultures involved through anthropological studies, we know that out of the 100 or so names that the Native Americans had for Bigfoot, according to Sasquatch believers, only about two or possibly three are actually referring to a wild man. What the Bigfoot researchers failed to realize is that not all mythology can simply be taken at face value and most certainly cannot be attributed to real life occurrences in most cases. That would be like saying the Native Americans are too stupid to have imaginations. Oh, I will not debate that. I will not debate that uh, a lot. There's a lot of mythology with uh, Native American legends. I won't debate that. I'm sure there are. I, I, again, I think that's possible. In the overwhelming majority of cases, mythological tales are simply storytelling to pass the time, very much like the films and books of today's world. They are meant as cautionary tales, scary tales, adventure tales, and some may have grains of truth, such as the misidentification of known animals behaving differently than expected, which is most certainly the case in the majority of sightings in modern times. Ah, uh, eh, wrong! Mountain men who were strange hermits that wore large pelts of animals could be a scary wild man sight to many settlers and Native Americans alike, for example. Well, how do you explain creatures that you know, stand about seven and a half, eight to me, even up to ten foot tall, and may weigh upwards of eight, nine hundred, a thousand pounds. Could everybody be lying, 
or hallucinating? Predictably so, modern eyewitnesses are convicted in their beliefs and sure of what they saw. However, it is certain that they believe they saw something which they did, in fact, see. However, it is not what they think it is. A person can be quite sure of something and be mistaken all the same. That I will concede. With that said, and with the lack of any evidence whatsoever that a Bigfoot ever existed on the North American continent, it is almost scientific certainty that Bigfoot does not exist. Uh, eh, wrong! Wrong! Jeff Meldrum has examined the footprint casts. There has been uh, a lot of other physical evidence that has been found. The Pacific Northwest is not the type of habitat that primates live in. They tend to live in areas where there is an abundance of fruit in a tropical climate. This is completely wrong for the Pacific Northwest. Well, you know, have you ever heard of them adapting? They adapted. Hello? And besides, I mean, people like Esteban Sarmiento and Angelo Caparella and Ian Redman and others have said that is almost a perfect um, climate for them to live in. And there is fruit, by the way. You ever heard of berries? You ever heard of uh, apple orchards that they raid and things like that? I guess you never heard of that. No. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever of a Bigfoot-type creature at all, aside from Gigantopithecus, which was predictably an animal which lived in Asia. Well, that's your opinion, but you're wrong, dude. You're wrong. There is, in fact, a fossil record of Giganto in Asia. There is not in North America. Well, that doesn't mean anything. What, are you saying that um, just because there's a fossil record in Asia, does, that, that means that must not be one here in the U.S.? Get out of here with that stuff. There is no reason to believe that such creatures still exist, and believe me, for creatures of that size, there would be, and they would be in Asia, not North America. They would not have traveled across an ice bridge. Well, well, how do we know it was an ice bridge? We don't know that. You don't know that either. You know, in fact, it may have been more a temperate climate, uh, that, that bridge that, uh, that they crossed over. It may have been literally a land bridge at one time. It doesn't mean it was an ice bridge. There is no evidence in the food chain whatsoever such creatures existing in modern times, and yet there would have to be tens of thousands of them roaming about. It would take a population of tens of thousands of them to be sustainable. Not necessarily. There may be only as, as many as maybe hundreds in the Pacific Northwest. Maybe a thousand. You know, although, you know, Grover Krantz ball ballparked it at 2,000. When we start talking about eight large 8 to 10 foot creatures numbering in the tens of thousands running about eating, it would be very evident in the food chain that animals, such animals existed. It would be obvious. Well, dude, obviously you've probably never been to the Pacific Northwest. You've probably never seen all the vast areas that there are out there. I've been there. I've seen these areas. You can hide a whole herd of elephants out there in some of these places. So far, not a single sh shred of evidence has ever come forth proving the existence of the creature. There has been DNA evidence tested which result in every animal except the Bigfoot. Because people were turning in what they thought was Bigfoot DNA or Bigfoot, um, what do you call it, um, um, hairs and scat and all that. There have never been any Bigfoot droppings? Uh, yeah, there have been. They've been unidentified, but I'm pretty sure they were probably Bigfoot. Some of them have been found. They had uh, parasites in them, which were native to China. There have never been any Bigfoot droppings or even a body discovered. Well, that's true. There's been, there has been no body discovered in modern times. Bear carcasses are found all the time, dispelling the notion that a Bigfoot carcass would deteriorate without ever being found. Well, how many of those bears died a natural death? How many of those bears weren't shot by hunters? How many of those bears weren't smacked into by a logging truck? Yeah, you know, that's the question you have to ask yourself, Mr. Dark. 
There have been scientists such as the incompetent Jeff Meldon that couldn't distinguish the fake tracks left by Wallace. He was also involved in the Skookum cast, which is rumored to be an imprint in the mud of a Bigfoot laying down. It turned out to be from an elk. According to who? Elk experts don't even say it's an elk. They've had elk experts look at that, and, and, they, and they, they say that's not an elk. Where are the hoof prints in the middle of the Skookum cast that would indicate an elk rising up? It would have to stand up on its, le on its feet, on four feet. You don't see that in the middle of the Skookum cast. I've seen a copy of the Skookum cast. Clearly incompetent and wishful thinking. The actual evidence for the creature doesn't exist at all, nor will it ever because the animal doesn't exist. So certain are you. What it really is, for those of you who want to know and who love a good mystery, is it's simply a hoax dreamed up by Ray Wallace. Oh, really? You see, Ray Wallace was a prankster and he had heard some Native American tales, too. In fact, he used one of them as what is the inspiration for his hoax, which turned out to be one of the all-time greatest hoaxes ever. And there's no absolute evidence of that. Ray Wallace and his family members wanted to play a practical joke with some of the guys working on his lumber crew. So Wallace has some large wooden, fake wooden feet made. These feet were taken and imprints were made all around the job site. This really freaked out his victim a lot more than Wallace could have hoped for. And the local newspaper reported the story sending it out on the news wire. It was coined Bigfoot and that's how it all started. Wallace upped the ante and kept milking it for decades. Well now, first of all, I don't think Ray Wallace was even on a lot of those jobs. Where where, where was Ray Wallace? He wasn't there. <clears throat> he thought it was just absolutely hilarious. His family wouldn't say anything at all at Wallace's request. It was just a family secret that blew up way beyond even what Wallace himself had anticipated. So what do you do if you're Wallace? Well, it keeps getting funnier and funnier because it keeps getting more and more serious. Professionals and scientists get involved. Other hoaxers start making tracks. Supposed sightings occur. It just keeps getting better and better. So how do you top it? How do you give the ultimate hoax? It'll take more than some oversized wooden feet to do that. No. What you need is a film. That's the next best thing, and that'll drive everyone wild to historical conclusion. So that's where all this comes in. Comes in. Now see, you look at this. Look at this. Uh, look at this uh, wooden feet, wooden foot right here. Now that's supposed to be. That's supposed to be, this is supposed to be a match for this? Uh-uh. No, that dog won't hunt. Only one set of the Wallace wooden feet has been released by the family. There is, in fact, a second set, which has never been examined by professionals and used to use as far back as the original 1958 lumber job site hoax, which began the Bigfoot myth. <clears throat> oh, really? Well, it's been almost 15 years since Ray Wallace passed away and all this was all this information was put out, but yet we've never heard of this mysterious other set of wooden feet. So 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 pray tell, where are they? And why didn't the Wallace family reveal them? Oh, do do tell, do tell. The Patterson Gimlin film hoax. Now all this research for images originated with me, so I'm not the first to draw this conclusion, but I have expounded upon it and connected the dots. I will post sources soon so that all credit is given where it is due. I could not have done all this alone. This has been posted to Bigfoot groups and some of the members when faced with this got upset about it. They then tried to ridicule me for this, but this right here is the Hollywood inside story of the whole thing. We will show you who made the costume, where it came from, the styles of makeup techniques used in creating it and how it was obtained. I have come to the conclusion through various things brought to my attention that Bob Gimlin had to be aware of the hoax. I mean, Bob Gimlin can be seen in the video. Well, first of all, it's not a video, it's a film. Not covering Roger with a rifle as he had said before and still does to this day, so he had to know it was a hoax. Okay, this is from Leroy Blevins. And he has been, I'm sorry, he's been discredited. Many times. He seems to think that he sees Bob Gimlin in the bushes. Well, you know, it's just like clouds. You can take an image and you can think you see faces in it. <coughs> Here, I'm going to take a close look at this picture of Bob Gimlin. And look at this, this admittedly 
ambiguous image. I mean, look at this. Does that look anything? It may, it may to some, look like the size of a face. But you can find face. It's called pareidolia. This is pareidolia right here. Pareidolia is thinking you see something and you don't in a picture. Like I say, you can do it with clouds. You can do it with all kinds of stuff. I could go out here and take a picture of these, this little forest, this little wood line out here. I could point out, I could pick out faces that aren't even there. But yet, you know, I think they're there. And so that's because of pareidolia. The caption says, The man behind the brush stands at 5'6 to 5'9, and the height of Bob Gillen 5'8. The face of Bob Gillen matches the face of the man behind the brush, and the man behind the brush is Bob Gimlin. Well, Bob is probably uh, in a pair of boots. He's probably about 5'6", 5'7". He's about as tall as I am, maybe a little bit taller. I've met Bob Gimlin. So that figure, 5'8", could be correct as far as if he was wearing boots. But still, this is just pareidolia. You know, it's not, it's, it's, to me, it's really not to be taken seriously. Here we can see clear, we can clearly see that Bob Gillen was in fact there that, at that time of the filming. He certainly wasn't covering Roger with a rifle as he states that he was doing. He was hiding in the bushes next to Patty. Now, why would he do that? See, that doesn't make any sense. Why, if, if you're if you're trying to if you're if you're making a hoax film. Why would you have one of the individuals that's there on the film site hide in a bush to expose the hoax? It would make no sense at all. Occam's razor, folks. There are way too many variables to the story behind the PG film for it to be true, and the following are the words of people in the entertainment industry. There has been a lie circulating by a few fringe believers such as Bill Munns that no one could have made such a suit at that point in history. However, this is not true at all. It entirely could have been done and was. There are many similar suits from the time and even the eight men of 2001 from a year later disproved those silly notions. So the lie is being exposed finally. Well, the man who made the suits for 2001 was Stuart Freeborn. And Roger Patterson probably did not know anything about him and did not recruit him to make a suit for him. But in order to make it more panty-like, you would need thicker lips with a philotrum. The little fold are on human upper lips not found on apes and the forehead should be thicker, etc. The main thing was that the nose was too small. Patty's nose was much wider and had a golf ball looking round tip. I'd never seen a single mask that had all those qualities, so I went looking. I tried various Don Post mask combos and found some that would work, but it would take some artistic skills to pull off. Patterson had artistic skills and could have done it, yet since the suit showed the techniques that were used in 66-67 by Waugh and his crew, I decided to look at their masks too. If the body came from among his people, then the mask would have too. I learned that one mask did have that golf ballish nose that Philotrum. It was molded by Wa Chang himself for an episode of Star Trek. It also had the thicker lips that curved the same way Patty's did. I looked for behind-the-scenes photos of it and compared it to Patty. The story involved a planet with primitive giant cavemen who left huge footprints and wore animal skins. They used a wig that was like a pointed cap that fit over the slanted head of the caveman. By the time I already made a wider nose and glued that on top of my tour mask and I filled out the jaw using a rubber piece, I glued some bits of foam to the forehead and painted over that with latex. Still, the upper lip was too short and the lips too thin to match Patty. <clears throat> I contacted a Star Trek collector. He got some behind-the-scenes pics for me from one of the original Star Trek producers. Though none had the mask in the exact position of our clearest Patty image, what I saw confirmed the, what I had discovered. The sharp cheek matched. The wider golf ball nose was there. The lips were the same. The philotrum was there. The measurements were the same. The jawline was there. The forehead and ear also matched. Well, you know, again, do we really know this for certain? 
I obtain even clearer and closer images as well as images of Waugh's original clay sculpture for the face. And I can see something else interesting, a problem with the eyes. Hieronymus had said there was a problem with when he, when he turned his head. A gap showed. Roger used one of Bob H.'s fake eyes to hide this. Uh, well, you know, Hieronymus, he, 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 he can't even tell you what pair of socks he was wearing 50 years ago. I mean, Hieronymus, he's, he's so full of, he's so full of crap, he's full of more crap than a Christmas goose. He's told, let's see, how many, how many stories, he's told about 50 story, different stories as to that, as to what happened that day. You can't, you can't believe any of them. Let's see. I obtained even clearer. I can see something else. You can see from this close shot that Wah had stuck an extra layer close to the face and painted it black, hoping to hide the gap that had developed. Later on, a simple touch-up would blend the area around the eyes there, but there was no time on the day of the trek shoot to do that. In that black and white image of my own mask next to Patty, I have also used a fake eye in the right eye hole. The Wa mask is being worn by the gigantic Buck Mafi from Corriganville. He worked with Wa Chambers and Yanos on, pro on projects as well. Okay, this is supposed to look like Patty. And there might be a slight superficial resemblance, but it's nothing like what we see in the Patterson Gimlin film. If you look at the wide nostrils of Patty, you'll see they match. When I made my stunt dummy into a Bigfoot, I simply took the mask out of the hoodie that came with the Wookiee hair suit and put it over the head of my tour mask. Only later, quite by accident, did I notice that when I laid the typical hood that comes with all ape suits onto my tour mask, I got a little line around the skull. I could shift the hood around on the head and found that I could duplicate the same line around the head that Patty shows by rolling it under and sticking it down. And I noticed that the wig cap used by Wa on Star Trek for his mask fit on his head the same way. The nostrils and the face are exactly the same as Patty when more hair is added to the hair mat used. Well, whatever you say, dude, because I, I, don't, I don't buy it for a second. If anyone cleaned up the Wa head and painted it gray, then added a glued on hair and a hair hood, it would be Patty, period. No way around it. Amazingly, the same group of creature FX artists that are credited with having made Patty for Roger use the techniques found in both Patty and their, their various monster suits. For them to have access to this head and also just happen to build monster suits using the same pad and hair methods as seen on Patty is just too much coincidence. One problem. They had to be paid. They, didn't, they wouldn't have done this stuff for free. Hollywood special effects guys don't do stuff for civilians for free. You know, where did Roger get the money to pay them? And don't tell me he borrowed it from his from his wealthy brother-in-law. No, uh -uh, I don't buy that for a minute either. Yes, the Hollywood Mirror Mail is correct. It was Chambers and the guys working with him that cobbled this thing together from spare creature suit parts. Just as they were doing a Lost in Space and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea in Star Trek at the time. And just as Vulik and the guys did sometimes to save time on Buffy. Chambers and Janos told the story they were supposed to say in public. Chambers said the same thing about having worked for the CIA on secret missions. Gosh, I only wish I were that good, but no, I had nothing to do with any of that stuff. Near the end of his life, the CIA gave an award to John Chambers for his work on secret missions from, for them. That stemmed from the Bay of Pigs to later Middle East missions. Actually, he was that good. Bob Burns. I worked at CBS and we took the film up there. I put it on my movie Ola and we went back and forth with it and went frame by frame. We gave it a really good and an honest shot. We really did. We projected it over and over in our honest opinion from having worked in gorilla suits was that it was a guy in a suit. The way it moved, it obviously looked like it had what we call a water bag in the stomach area which is an old trick that Charlie Gamora, the greatest ape man ever, I think, devised for his suit back in the 30s. That's the sort of liquid stomach thing to make it look like real flesh when you wiggle around. Of course, John would have known about the water bag because he knew Charlie Gamora. I certainly consider Gamora, and so does Rick, that's Rick Baker, the best gorilla man ever. 
It suits for the best. John Chambers had to know him because he finished his career over at Paramount as the head of their makeup department. John Bulick. I have heard that Chambers made the Patterson suit from at least two or three different people. Common sense. The footage looks like a suit. Looking at the stuff that Chambers did, the style and all that, and then having seen the stuff on Lost in Space, and just knowing that in that era, he was pretty much the only game in town that makes sense. It falls into place. Jim McPherson had heard that Chambers had built that suit, and that Chambers himself might not even have known what the suit was built for. I think that Patterson maybe had just called him up, <clears throat> and wanted to rent some kind of suit. Because at that time, he and Dick Smith were the best guys doing that kind of stuff. And he was more of an effects type guy than Dick Smith. Dick Smith was more of a makeup guy while Chambers was building suits and creatures. It was really pretty much the only game in town in the 60s. Bulick has an opinion as to how Patterson could have afforded to put his hopes together without the funds to have a suit fabricated. Patterson could not have afforded to have it scratch built. I can't imagine that someone like Patterson would have whatever a suit like that would have cost back then. I'm sure it would have been at least in the tens of thousands. He could have rented it, though. He probably called Chambers to rent a suit. I get calls from people all the time who want to rent something from me. I can see someone like Chambers renting it to someone <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for a grand or something and maybe redoing it and some and taking the head off another thing. That was my guess, just seeing it. John Bulick puts little credence in the long-held belief among Bigfooters that makeup artists have proclaimed the Patterson suit as impossible to duplicate. One guy wrote to me and said, you know, Disney people looked at it and they said that it couldn't be duplicated. Well, Disney was never known for doing prosthetic effects. I'll tell you, as a makeup artist looking at it, it's a guy in a suit. There's no doubt in my mind that it's a guy in a suit. They get into specifics like the way the head turns, that it turns like a gorilla. It turns that way because the suit was stiff and made from polyfilm, and he couldn't possibly turn his neck very well. Well, if it's stiff, then how can it be walking? Well, not every part of it is going to be stiff. The joints are going to be loose, etc. But I think it was a guy in a suit. The bottom line for Felix is a combination of my gut instinct, my knowledge of makeup, and all that I have heard that makes me think that Chambers made the Patterson suit. I do not have proof, but I definitely believe that he made it. Well, you know, you can rent suits all day long, but, but how can you afford... Here's the thing. If Patterson rented a suit and then, like, remodified it to have breasts and use this water bag trick and all this other rigmarole, well then, when he, when he, would he have been able to afford to rent the suit, first of all? Second of all, second of all, when he returned it to John Chambers, would it not have been altered, and would John Chambers not have asked questions, like, what did you do to my suit? See, that doesn't make, see, again, again, this is, this is just common sense, people. Dave Kinlan, I heard this again while working on Gorillas of the Mist at Rick Baker's studio. They just pulled out the old Harry and the Henderson's remote-controlled, excuse me, radio-controlled head, and we're talking about, quote-unquote, real Bigfoot sightings. I mentioned the Patterson Gimlin film, and Rick responded, you know that's the guy in his suit. John Chambers built that around the time of Planet of the Apes. It was common knowledge in the shop from around the time that they were building the Harry suits for Harry and the Hendersons. Howard Berger remembers hearing about the Chambers-Patterson suit connection in 1985. I always thought that it was kind of fake looking, and I remember seeing the Sun Classic Pictures movie In Search of Bigfoot or whatever, and they were saying, there was no way that this could ever be a man. And I'm thinking, what a bunch of crap. Of course it could be a man. I was working at Rick Baker's on Harry and the Hendersons, and we were talking about Bigfoot and talking about that, too. Same shape. In <clears throat> same dimensions, everything fits perfectly when the mask is modified with more facial hair and a different hair mat on, for the top of the head. The Wallace family member holds up the infamous fake feet, which were also used in the Patterson Gimlin film, proving Wallace was in fact involved in the hoax. Okay, now see, now look at this. These toes, you would have to be, you have to be half blind, half drunk, or half crazy to think that these toes are the same. These toes are not the same. 
And these don't even, these don't match. They don't match. Dude, go back to the drawing board. They don't match. Now, wait a minute. It just says red mud on his pants. Well, how can that be? There was, um, there was no red mud on the film site. It was all dark gray shale sand. Th this photograph is much more realistic to what the sand actually looked like at Bluff Creek. As you look over these photos, let me show you what they show. In photo three, it was taken at the site by Bob Gimlin. And the other photos were taken from the footage as Patterson made the last prints. Now, as you see the photo one and two, you see Patterson got red mud on his pants. And also got some of the plaster on his left leg. Now, when you look at the photo taken by Gimlin, you see that Patterson's pants were clean. Now, he has the same shirt on, but in photos 1 and 2, has mud and plaster on. In photo 3, there is no red mud or plaster, and all three photos were taken are from the site. So that makes the photo that Gimlin took of Patterson by the tree a second before the other two photos, as you see here. Now, the question, how can Patterson hold the prints in his hands by the tree before they took the print? And the answer is the prints he holds in his hands are the prints they made to make the prints to the site. Uh, you never heard of somebody having extra clothing and changing their clothing? You know, he may have changed his pants after he casted these footprints. He really did. And there's speculation that this photograph, and you can't see it, but it's a photograph of Roger standing by a tree holding the two footprint casts. There's speculation that that may have been taken in Yakima at night with a, with a light shining on him, not at the film site. Now, admittedly, that's just speculation. Now, I don't think Roger, I don't think Bob Gilman would remember when that happened. So, again, I mean, nice try, but uh, close but no cigar. Close up of Roger Patterson holding up the alleged Bigfoot track cast on the Patterson Gillen family along with the fake foot held up by the Wallace family member. When the fake foot is placed in mud to make the tracks in the manner in which they did, you can see how it would match up almost exact. No, you didn't. No, no. The toes are not the same. You'd have to be half blind, half crazy, or half drunk to, to, see, to say that these are the same. Galileo's seven mask is used on Star Trek and modified to become Patty in the Patterson Gimlin film. Again, there's a superficial resemblance, but not an exact resemblance. Even more incriminating evidence that this was all taken the same day and not the following day as reported. And he's referring to the photograph of six individuals, which is right here. And then, by the way, this photograph was not taken by Larry Lund. I must correct that. He only got, he only was able to, uh, he was only able to, um, he, he, was, he was only able to acquire it to, for his, in his possession by Jerry Lee Merritt. It was originally Jerry Lee Merritt's picture. And he gave it to Larry Lund. Because he called Larry Lund over to his house and said, hey, I got some things to give you. Because you knew, because I knew Roger Patterson, and he gave him this photograph, this photograph of six cowboys, which is, let's see if I get close, close. Okay, right here. This is a photograph. There's Roger Patterson. That is, I believe, John Ballard. There's Jerry Lee Merritt. I believe this is uh, Bob Haramis's brother, uh, Howard. Bob Gimlin wearing the Indian wig and Bob Hieronymus. That picture was taken in and around Yakima, Washington. And even Hieronymus said it was taken in Yakima. Even Greg Long and Cal Corp said that was taken in Yakima. 
not at Bluff Creek. Now, see this, see this photograph right here of Roger, these two photographs? These were to probably taken in Yakima. If these trees are, the, are a perfect match for this tree right here, then it's probable that that photograph was taken in Yakima and not at Bluff Creek. This of Roger holding the footprint casts. Now this right here, this footage, Okay, Mr. Dark claims this was taken at Bluff Creek. These were taken at Bluff Creek, yes. This was taken in Yakima. Again, even Greg Long, Cal Corp, and Bob Hieronymus say that was taken in Yakima. Bigfoot researchers often comment on how Patty is a female and who would have thought to make a female monkey suit. Wallace would. His wife played Bigfoot in some of his hoax photographs. Wallace also told Roger Patterson where to go that day and when to see his Bigfoot. Patterson has, also, has sought out Wallace for information on Bigfoot and was in need of money desperately. He was trying to get an advance in pay on a documentary funding for a hunt of a hunt for Bigfoot. So how he managed to get the greatest piece of wildlife photography ever filmed on first try, and 50 years later, no one else has even come close to mystery. No way, it isn't. It's a hoax. Uh, no, it isn't. Uh, let's see. Then we have this. He, um, this. This is from Leroy Blevins. He claims there's horses in these frames. He claims to see horses. Once again, pareidolia. Search for Bigfoot outlives the man who created him. Ray Wallace is the mastermind behind the Bigfoot hoax, the originator of the phenomenon. Even Roger Patterson was ousted by the Photoshop clerk who served him while he was looking into what type of camera to use. Patterson allegedly, yes, you should, that's what you should say, allegedly brought in a skinny version of one of the Bigfoot tracks as proof. This didn't impress the Photoshop clerk who stated there's two, that's too narrow, to support such an animal. The heel had to be much wider. Roger Patterson replied with, I can fix that. There will be some who still deny these claims, saying that it's real and a man can't walk that way, or suits like that couldn't have been made in the late 60s, and all sorts of other things of that nature, which are not only inaccurate and misinformed, but wildly out of touch with the reality. No, dude, I think you're out of touch with the reality. The Bigfoot researchers say that no human can walk that way in the film. Well, yes, they can. When you're wearing long clown's feet, you can't place the ball of your foot down first. You have to put your foot down flat, otherwise you'll stumble. Another thing, when you put on the gorilla head, you can only turn your head up maybe a quarter of the way. And to look behind you, you've got to turn your head and your shoulders and your hips. Plus, the shoulder pads are in the suit, are in the way of the jaw. That's why the big foot turns and looks the way he does in the film. He has to twist his entire upper body. Relatively interesting. Okay. Okay, then. If Hieronymus claims to be the, the man the suit in the Patterson Gimlin film, then he would have been walking one eyed, with one freaking eye, one good eye, in a mask, and the mask is going to inhibit your vision anyway. It's hard enough seeing out of one eye, one good eye, really. It's even, the, the, the problem is even more compounded when you walk in a suit wearing a mask with one good eye. Now that's a Star Trek Galileo 7 mask with extra facial hair, a different hair mat, a paint job, and clean up if I ever saw one. Excuse me. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I think he is wearing the wooden feet used to make the Bigfoot tracks. That certainly appears to be the case as the soles don't match up with the heels. Uh, yeah, they do. 
I don't know what you're looking at. <coughs> Furthermore, Wallace used a truck as a makeshift sort of plow to achieve the depth and the prints he made at the lumber site <coughs> in 1958 and in various locations. It would be quite simple with a slight modification to use the same sort of setup with horses pulling. This is how they got the depth of the prints. Their claims still cannot answer how a mask of a creature never before seen or photographed can exist before the creature is seen and photographed. What? What's that supposed to mean? If the PG film came first, we could say that Patty influenced the mask, but that's not the case. Or even why a hoaxer that started the Bigfoot phenomena would hoax anything at all. Especially for decades, if he was so savvy on where and when to find the real Bigfoot, as was evidenced when he told Roger Patterson where and when to go that day to see his Bigfoot. I mean, <clears throat> if those things can be answered in any other light than the hoax, I'm all ears. Case closed is a hoax. No, it's not case closed. Maybe to you it's case closed. But see, I mean, you're obviously... You know, this is all conjecture from you. This is your opinion. You're entitled to your opinion. I'm not going to say that you're not. But um, I'll just close with this. Um, Renee DeHinden had a great saying. It was, everybody has the right to their own opinion, but nobody has the right to be wrong about the facts. If you don't have the facts, your opinion is of no value. Anyway, I mean, there is another article this guy has written that I'm going to go through and um, respond to as well. So I'll catch you guys later. Y'all be good or be good at it.